have a community moment. This is a chance for someone, for someone from the community to come on and give a about eight to 10 minute talk about something going on in their lives. Maybe a book they've read or an idea that they've had on their mind. This week's community moment can be given by Laura Winnington. I wanted to also uh, make a brief announcement before I got started. If you would like to do a community moment at any point in the future, you can email speak at houstonoasis.org and you will reach the newly formed speakers committee and we'll get you on the schedule for a community moment. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about one of my it's sort of an intersection of two of my favorite topics. Um, my entire career has been based around making and fitting costumes for performers. And a while ago, someone suggested I do a community moment on how your clothes should fit. And that sounded pretty boring to me. I don't really want to talk about where pants and should go and dressing to suit your shape. Um, so most of this talk will be based around another area that I spent far too much of my time thinking about, and that is true crime. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Got it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to base my thesis for this talk on something I learned about when I was taking costume history as an undergraduate, uh, which is Dr. J.C. Flugel's theory of dress. Dr. Flugel was a British psychiatrist in the 1930s, and he pondered the subject, why do people wear clothes? Or why do they choose the clothes that they wear? And there are three main reasons for wearing clothes and for determining the choices that you make. Uh, the first is protection. Protection against the elements from extreme heat, extreme cold, rain, wind. Uh, protection in battle or in sport. And then there's also the psychological protection that you get from your clothes. Uh, some people believe in wearing healing crystals. Some people go in, you know, ancient tribes go into battle with face paint on, and that was that had a protective aspect as well. And then there's, you know, if you are feeling a little blue and tired, the comfort of a cuddly gray hoodie, which is also sort of protective. The second reason is modesty which is covering the parts of the body your particular culture deems unacceptable to display in public. This is a constantly moving goal, goalpost, though, because modesty is a social construct, and different cultures have different ideas of what modesty is, and even in Western dress, if you look at what people wore over the last hundred years, you know, in Victorian times, women were supposed to cover their ankles and up to their necks. And obviously, that's evolved over the last hundred or so years. The third reason is decoration. People like interesting and pretty things, and they also like covering their body in their favorite color, with interesting textures, and shiny stones. So I know of two professions that utilize the psychology of dress. Costume designers, and FBI profilers and behavioral analysts. I'm going to talk about profiling. <laughs> this comes from Incendiary, the Psychiatrist, the Mad Bomber, and the Invention of Criminal Profiling, which tells the story of the first known case law enforcement sought the advice of a psychologist to create a profile of their suspect. The Mad Bomber planted pipe bombs in New York City between the years of 1940 and 1956. In 1956, 16 years into their search and writing out of ideas, the New York City Police took all of their evidence from the Bonner case to Dr. James Russell of the New York State Commission for Mental Hygiene. Based on the Bonner's letter and the manner in which the bombs were constructed, Russell came up with this profile. Male, as historically most Bonners are male. Suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, based on his persistent, unalterable, <laughs> systematized, and logically constructed delusions. A former Con Edison employee who was holding a grudge against the company. Unable to hold down a steady job or a romantic relationship because of his mental state and a physical ailment. An unmarried loner, most likely lives with relatives as he cannot earn his own income. 
precise, neat, and tidy, based on his handwriting and the workmanship of his bombs. Foreign-born, or living among a community of the foreign-born, based on linguistic analysis of his letters. Possibly Slavic, as bombs were favored in Middle Europe, possibly residing in Connecticut, as it had a high concentration of Slavic immigrants, and many of his letters were postmarked from Westchester County. He would be in his 40s or 50s, based on the fact that he was employed for Con Edison in the 1930s, and based on the fact that schizophrenia developed slowly. Brussels advised the police to publish this profile in the newspaper and draw the bomber out, as he would be convinced of his own intelligence and superiority, and although he did not want to be arrested, he desperately wanted credit for his ingenious bombs and sympathy for the wrongs done to him against Con Edison. Brussels ended with this statement. When you find him, he will be wearing a double-breasted suit. It will be buttoned. The police followed his advice. They worked with the New York Journal American to publish news stories that would entice the bomber to write to the paper. And this led them to 56-year-old George Viteski, the son of a Lithuanian immigrant, a former Con Edison employee. He had tuberculosis. He had never married, he had not held a steady job in years, and he lived in Waterbury, Connecticut with his two aunts. Police knocked on his door shortly before midnight and found George in his PJs. They asked him for a handwriting sample. It was a match. They searched his home and found a garage bomb in the garage a bomb-making workshop in surgically neat order. They placed him under arrest and asked him to get dressed to go to the station. When he re-emerged from his room, he was wearing a gray, double-breasted suit, buttoned. So how was Brussels able to guess exactly what Metesky would be wearing by employing what he knew about the bomber and what he knew about clothes? Uh, a fastidious and neat individual such as Metesky would favor a suit as opposed to more casual wear. He had been a blue-collar worker but had dressed for upper management. Metesky's clothes would be dated as he had not been able to work for some time, and double-breasted suits were in fashion in the 1930s, and not so much in the 1950s. Uh, also, as a paranoid personality, Brussels imagined that the bomber would feel shielded from the world in enveloping clothes. Again, something double-breasted and buttoned. So, beyond true crime, in paying attention to my own attire, and the entire of people I see around me, I see some patterns. On days when I wake up a little more tired than usual, I usually put on a black and gray t-shirt. Not really this morning, I had another reason, and that's just to illustrate that there are numerous reasons that someone can pick to wear a specific outfit. So while this is an interesting topic to sort of dive into and think about, I'm just going to say that you can't look at a person and automatically go, oh, great t-shirt, you must be exhausted. <laughs> um, but I do know that when I don't feel well, I tend to not wear bright colors. And I think I'm subconsciously telling the world around me, this color was a little too, color wasn't just a little too much for me this morning, so give me some space. Shortly after I got a promotion at work, I found myself buying a lot of large statement necklaces. Why? Was it the 21st century workplace equivalent of pinning a medal to my chest? And the more I think about it, a lot of my female bosses and supervisors over the years have worn large necklaces. Was I trying to emulate them and declare myself part of their club? And then there is the conscious effort that people put into their clothing to send a message. A person or group can craft a look to send a message. And for instance, Robert Spencer has said that his polished, or, I'm sorry, Richard Spencer has said that his polished, tailored look is to deliberately counter the stereotype of white supremacists as dirty hillbillies and overalls. But I don't think it had exactly the effect he intended because putting white supremacy in a different package hasn't made it any more palatable to those who already have a problem with it. And in some ways, we've seen this packaging before. Men who don't share Spencer's views are quickly abandoning the fashy haircut so as not to be confused with his followers. And again, I'm not suggesting that by looking at someone's clothes, you can infer everything about them, but I find this topic fascinating. 
I love looking at fashion history, looking at the themes within a certain time period, and then comparing it to what was going on in the world at that time. Politics, the social things, the culture. It's one of my favorite subjects, and it's quite frankly my favorite aspect of costuming.